on a Sunday you you have come here. I thank you especially uh, for that. I'm still in Saturday. I'm still in Saturday. I will be speaking to you, of course, about the Rama Setu matter, but I like to place it in perspective, um, and that's why I will first make some introductory remarks to see the Rama Setu matter in perspective. I myself uh, began being concerned about the problems of the Hindu society is that Hindu society is facing. Really, after the arrest of uh, the Shankaracharya of Kanchi, and when I found that that he had been sent to jail like a common criminal on a on a case which was totally manufactured, I mean, of course, somebody did was murdered. There's no doubt, but but the foisting of that case on uh, the Shankaracharya uh, meant that there were some forces working. Uh, which wanted to undermine Hindu society, and by putting him in jail and treating him this way, uh, they could create an atmosphere amongst Hindus to feel inferior, feel important, and that would lay the foundation for for undermining the Hindu society in future. And when you look at other problems, also you find that the same way the Hindu society seems to be the target. If you look at terrorism today, uh, you find that invariably the target is uh, the Hindu. If the temples are uh, uh, bombs are thrown in the temples, they are not thrown in churches and in and masjids. It's not uh, true to say that the terrorists have no religion, have no uh, no address. They are just uh, violent people because they have a um, Method in that madness, and that method, madness method is to target the Hindu. When it comes to uh, conversion, religious conversion, it's only the Hindu who is being converted. The target is again the Hindu the community. Look at the history books, the distortions that are taking place, whether it's in this country or any other country. Again, you find it's the Hindu history which is distorted and written in a in a way which debases the Hindu society. So if you go along, all along, in all these major problems that are facing the country, you find that the Hindus are essentially on what I call as the siege. They are being attacked from all sides and it's clear that uh, there is a major effort being made. Which are the forces which are at work and all I'll come to a little later. But I think that's what I need uh, to point out. Now many people say, how can Hindus be on the siege? They are 83 percent of the population, and uh, how can such a big majority be on the siege? Well, uh, numbers are not by themselves enough. Uh, if you have a thousand goats standing in a in a forest and one uh, tiger comes, all the goats will run away uh, just in front of one tiger. Nor is it uh, the capacity, the strength, that again is not enough. I give the example of a circus. There will be one thin ringmaster and there will be five fierce lions and they will be in the ring and he will be totally, the ringmaster will be totally within the ring. He cannot escape anywhere and he will have only a whip and he'll crack the whip and make the lion climb up uh, a chair or climb up a bench and so on. The lion will make noises but ultimately it will obey him. Each of those lions was strong enough with his paw to give one hit to the, uh, to the ringmaster and he would die. But they don't, they all obey. So it's not, you know, to say I'm strong as a lion, well, it depends on your mind. So ultimately, it's the mindset that's, that is important. And it's the Hindu mindset which I would like to focus on. And today, the attack on Hindus is no more physical like Mohammed Ghori's or Ghazni or Robert Laclai and so on. It's uh, much more the mental subversion that is taking place. And that is what we have to be aware of. If you ask me why... Uh, uh, 
why I uh, why I would uh, I've taken up this issue in such strength because I think Ram Setu was another example of where a the Hindu society was being targeted in a very subtle psychological way, and that is why uh, I decided that it should be taken up. Now, <clears throat> when I say mindset, what I mean is that all of us think that we are very good Hindus because we go to uh, temples, we do puja, we celebrate Diwali, and so we think that's that is what it means being a good Hindu. No, that's not enough. You Hindu must have a corporate psychology, a corporate mind. He is being if five hundred thousand Hindus are driven out from Kashmir, your own country, and they are living in a refugee camp. It's called a refugee camp. Imagine Hindus being called Indian citizens, Hindus being called refugees, and they are living in refugee camps in Delhi and in Jammu. And they've been living since 1989, and there's just no one, no one seems to care. And that, that is the psychology I'm talking about. The whole of India should feel annoyed, upset, you know, in a state of rebellion. Then how can 500,000 people, uh, Hindus, be driven out just because they are Hindus? And people worry about uh, masjid being broken in one place, but every day temples are being broken in uh, Kashmir. And there are other places too. And uh, for example, a, a, if you take Malaysia, look what's happening to the Hindus there. What is happening in Guyana, what's happening in Kazakhstan. The Hindus are being systematically targeted, not only here but all over, because Hindus don't, uh, they can't they do it for other religions because the other religions have countries of their own. Hindus, unfortunately, don't have a country of their own. There was only one called Nepal and that's also gone now. So essentially, the Hindu corporate psychology is what I would like to uh, emphasize and uh, speak to you about. The forces made against Hindus, is, uh, they are very well organized and one has to respect that in the sense that they are organized and they, are, they do their work very systematically. To convert uh, 100 million Hindus as uh, uh, Pat, uh, not, uh, uh, the religious leader Pat Robertson uh, said in a meeting in Dallas about two years ago, he said that uh, we must uh, make it uh, a target of 1 billion people of the world to become Christians because Christianity is declining in Europe, it's, uh, its quality uh, of adherence in, uh, in Latin America is poor. So we must get people from Asia and 1 billion people should come from Asia. And in that he said 100 million should come from India and cost should not be any criteria. And that's why today any group can just go to the internet and type and say I want to build a church and immediately a check will arrive. And in Andhra this is happening in a, in a, in a, in a really big way because the chief minister there he may have the last name Vendi but his, father, his middle name is Samuel. And he, he himself when I met him he told me that people think that because I'm a Christian I'm anti-Hindu. And so he understands that people are now becoming aware of, of this uh, matter. So I would say that uh, the Christian missionary mission is very clear that we must convert a hundred million uh, Hindus to Christianity and that means you cannot do it unless you first uh, make the Hindu feel inferior, develop an inferiority complex, then only this conversion can take place. As far as Islam is concerned, they are even clearer than Christians. Because they have, uh, it's no use quoting the Quran to me because for everything said in one page in Quran, there's a contradiction in another page. So the Quran is not the real guide of the, of the Islamic theology. The real guide of the Islamic theology is, uh, theology is in Sirah and Hadith. Uh, Sirah is about the life of, uh, uh, of Muhammad and Hadith is about his sayings. Those are the things which uh, you have to read and find out what is in their mind. I was, uh, you know, the question is, in Kashmir the Muslims are in majority and they are driven out the Hindus. It's a country of 83% Hindus, but how is this happening? Because there, in that pocket of Kashmir, we have Muslims in majority and they are able to uh, drive away 
the Hindus and create a pure Hindu Muslim state. And that's happening in the district level. If you go to, uh, if you go to Miro, you find the same kind of atmosphere. Go to Mau, Mau is a Muslim majority district. And as a consequence, they cannot celebrate uh, Ramayana. They cannot celebrate Diwali. That's the kind of thing there have been recently, about a year ago, there was a riot there because the MLA and the MP of the area elected on majority vote. They say, no, you, you cannot do it. You want to do it, do it in your own house, but you cannot put microphone and, and do it. Now, this kind of mental mentality, you can see in other parts of the country. In Tamil Nadu, which is only 5% Muslim, there, there are 40 town panchayats where the Muslims are in majority. And you have to go visit that to know what is happening. I was visited, I was, I had my, my house in, near Bello, a place called Mir Vishalam. And uh, people, Hindus came there. And they told me, we are from Mir Vishalam, town panchayat, and we haven't got any civic communities for the last uh, 20 years. So we have come to you for help. I said, what about your MLA? Uh, MLA, he's not interested in us. Then I said, what about your uh, MP? He says, oh, he doesn't bother about us. So what about, what about the collector? He says, collector just receives our petition, don't do anything about it. So I said, what is your problem? He says, our problem is that we are 25% of, of Mel Vishalam. And uh, when the elections take place, the 75% Muslim, they vote 100% of their people in. And after that, the town Pajat, they tell us very clearly, you want a school, you want the roads, you want roads, you want uh, the garbage to be clean, then you must convert to Islam. Then we will do it for you. And uh, they said that, you know, we refuse to do that, but they ruin our agriculture because they are running an animal tannery and they diverted the water of uh, uh, the processed water uh, from the tannery to our fields and therefore our agriculture crop is also dead. I couldn't believe that this was happening in India. So I went to Mel Vishal and saw it in my own eyes. Then I asked them, where are your own petitions in the last 20 years? They gave me this big file. So I took that file and uh, I went to the uh, High Court and I filed a case. At first the Chief Justice was really angry with me. He said, why are you bringing such communal issues? We didn't expect this of you. I said, I'm not coming on communal issues. I am coming under Article 15 of the Constitution. It says you must protect the minority. Unless you say that everybody in India is a minority except the Hindu community. Uh, and in that case, I will not. I leave the court right now. But this is a Hindu minority. And this is how they are being treated. And therefore, under the Constitution, Section 50, Article 15, you have to protect them. And then he asked me to lead evidence. I led this whole thing, uh, read out how they've been petitioning and petitioning, and they don't have schools, they have uh, garbage is not collected, the roads are in total disrepair, etc., etc. And that uh, the uh, town panchayat also has issued notice to the Hindu community if you want anything and you give a petition, you must write to us in Urdu, then only we will. So the Tamil state. But uh, they demanded that. And then I thought this may be an uh, a, 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 a exceptional case. Then I found there are 40 town panchayats in Tamil Nadu, Tundi in Rameshwaram, and all over Tamil Nadu, and all 40 places, the same story is there. I'm happy to report that the, so the High Court then issued a notice to the governor saying, act on this or divide up the uh, town panchayat so that the Hindus can serve the one uh, in that area. So this, uh, this, this kind of mentality comes out of the ideology. The ideology is Islam views the world in two parts, Darul Islam or Darul Harab. If it's Darul Islam, that means the Muslims are in power. If they are in power, then of course anyone who is non-believer is a kafir or a, or a dhimmi and therefore he is only fit for menial work. And uh, the Muslims will rule and then they will have their own Sharia law, etc, etc. But if it is Dawud Harab, then you see 
the Muslim uh, minority, which is not in power, is empowered by the Sita and the Adit to say, do anything unethical, but try to come to power. And that includes terrorism. If somebody says that terrorism is not backed by Islamic ideology, they're wrong. It's part of the concept of Darul Haram. And the only exception, only exception they have made is that if the Muslim is in such a shape that he can be exterminated or destroyed, they will make an alliance with the majority and live according to the rules that the majority tells you. And that's what Muhammad did with the Jews before he went to Medina. And, uh, and then of course he broke the, the agreement. So I would like to say that I am not complaining against Islam, I am not complaining against Christianity. They have got a clear mind. They know what to do. It is the Hindu who is not conf who is confused. He doesn't know what, what, is he, what it is and what he has to do. That confusion is what I am trying to remove by placing the whole conspiracy behind the destruction of Rama Setu. What is Rama Setu? First of all, know the geography of Rama Setu. If I can uh, make you imagine the coast, southern coast of India, you have from Calcutta coming down, from Visakhapatnam, etc., Madras, Tutikone, Kanyakumari, Kochi, Trivandrum, Kochi, etc. That's the Indian uh, peninsula. Now, somewhere along the uh, uh, Madurai, if you draw a straight line towards the ocean, you get, and you'll end up in a, uh, into the coastal line, but the coastal line is not a straight line. It comes up a little like that and turns in and then comes like that. That portion is called Mandapo. Uh, those of you who, who are from Tamil Nadu know this Mandapo. Then there is a uh, two kilometer uh, ocean uh, and then there is an island. And this island is about uh, 20 kilometers long, 25 kilometers long. That's called Rameshwaram Island, sometimes called Pambalan Island, where the Rameshwaram Temple is there. But you can go from the mainland to this island because there is a bridge which has been built, a railway bridge and a road bridge, so you just can go across. It's called the Paman Bridge. And this island ends in a place called Dhanushkodi. And Dhanushkodi onwards the Ramasetu starts and goes for about 48 kilometers. It's about 2 kilometers wide. And it's a causeway, some partly under the sea, partly above the sea. And there's a road tie, you can see the whole thing. You can go there by boat and climb onto it. And uh, the Ramasetu is there for all to see. There are enough photographs now, starting with NASA. Of course, the Indian Space Agency has also produced photographs. The Indian Space Agency photographs are covered in my book. And, you, uh, and therefore, there's no doubt that there is something like a causeway, it's not a bridge in the proper sense of the word, it's a causeway, 48 kilometers, then of course you have Talai Manar of Sri Lanka, that's the Setu. Now, Dhanush has, uh, his importance has been described by Valmiki's Ramayana. It says that when Rama, when Rama reached Dhanush then he saw this ocean, and he said, uh, he, he commanded the ocean, part, you know, so that we can go. And uh, the ocean just ignored him. So Rama was upset, so he pulled out his Agni Ban, that is the fire arrow, and he decided that he will evaporate the uh, ocean so that people can walk, his people can walk across. At that time, the Samudra Raja came up, and he begged Rama, don't do this. There are so many living beings, like the fishes, and seafood, etc., and they'll all die. Therefore, your objective is to go across. And if you look across, you will see that the seabed is not flat. It comes up as a ridge. And therefore, at that ridge, you put sand and then bring coral rocks from the uh, coastal line and put it there. And then on top of that, you put more clay, that is sand mixed with water, and then you've got a bridge. And you can cross across. That is exactly what happened. Uh, Hanuman and his army brought coral rocks from the coastal area and they put first clay and then they put the uh, coral rocks and then they covered it with the sand. And that exactly is the structure even today. 
If you go to see the uh, in, uh, Geological Survey of India has produced this, and now the Ramasetu with this Setu uh, Corporation has also produced these documents. I present finding them in the court. The same structure is there. It's a ridge, then uh, uh, sand, then coral rocks, and then there is uh, sand on top. Now, what is the significance of the coral rocks being there? This is a report which has been hidden from, was hidden from the public eye by the government, was prepared by Dr. Badri Narayanan, who was the director of the Geological Survey of India. He had gone with his team uh, into water and had investigated the Ramasetu and he, he found it was a bridge, on it it was land, sand, then there were rocks, then there were everything. Now, I have given a map in my book of this from the Seto Samudram Corporation project, uh, which describes the various layers that constitute the uh, Ramasetu. So, this Ramasetu, uh, um, being it is, Dr. Uh, Badri Narayan said that coral rocks will never grow on loose sand base. They have to have a solid ground on which they will grow. And therefore, and coral rocks are after all living beings which have been merged into, uh, into a rock form. And you will find them only in the coastal uh, part. We will never find them in the mid sea and that too on top of the, uh, <coughs> on top of the, uh, of our loose uh, sand or clay uh, base. And therefore, it is quite clear, but, uh, but the nine concluded, that these rocks were brought there and put there. And, uh, therefore, uh, it is clear that his having said this, the government of India should have investigated. How was it brought there? When was it brought there? And who put it there? Uh, the Englishman calls it uh, Adam's Bridge, as if Adam's Bridge. So now Adam's never built it. Even the mythology of the Islamic people is that Adam was kicked out from the heaven. He came to India and he walked across to Sri Lanka. So if he walked across, there must have been a bridge already to walk across on. Uh, therefore, it cannot be Adam's Bridge. This is Englishman deliberate habit of renaming everything uh, in his own uh, way to de deprive the Hindu of his uh, legacy, uh, named it Adam's Bridge. But now, thanks to this controversy, slowly Adam's Bridge uh, name has been forgotten. <laughs> so, this, uh, that this is man-made has been established by the Geological Survey of India's report, which I have filed in the Supreme Court. And as so far, they have not been able to rebut it. Of course, the government has still not got a chance to reply to all my arguments. The order we got was ex parte, in a sense, and I'll come to that in a minute. But I want to say that, uh, that there is a structure, and the structure is a massive structure, two kilometers wide, 48 kilometers long. It's an engineering marvel. Its structure, the way it looks, uh, is exactly as described in the Ramayana uh, of Valmiki. Valmiki says that there are three Shivalingas. And you can see three Shivalingas even today if you go by boat uh, along the uh, Ramasetu or if you walk across. In fact, if you, if you, uh, there is no place where the water goes above your chest. In fact, the maximum it comes to is your hip. So next time you go to Ramishara, take a boat and go to Dhanushkodi and then you know, walk across on Ramasetu to the extent you can. So therefore, uh, it exists on that, there is absolutely no doubt. And the question is, uh, what is then the problem? The problem is that the, uh, the Ramasetu and the uh, Rameshwaram Island together, they span the whole uh, ocean from Indian coast to the Sri Lankan coast. And consequently, no ship can go unless they get a passageway through this. And uh, so that is point number one. Point number two is that north of the Ramasetu, the water is called Park Strait. South of the Ramasetu, the water is called Gulf of Mannar. And the two uh, waters together are known by the common name of Setu Samudra. 
Now, Silto Samudra, the, the ocean floor is shallow. And in other words, if a ship comes, it will, get, it will hit the bottom. And therefore, you have to follow a, uh, a canal in the ocean bed. It's not like the Suez Canal where you cut through uh, land. It's not like Panama Canal where you cut through land. It is cutting the ocean, digging or dredging through or a, in the ocean pit a furrow so deep enough so that ships can come. And they have decided to uh, dig a 20 meter uh, furrow in the ocean bed so the ships can go. So therefore one the Seto Samudran project involves two things. One, uh, digging a, a furrow in the ocean bed and two, uh, to take it uh, beyond this uh, uh, span of the Rameshwaram Island and uh, Ramasetu. From 1860, this, this investigation was going on. Committees after committees were set up. A total of 15 committees were set up. And each of them gave a recommendation. After independence, uh, six committees were set up. The first committee was set up in 1955, headed by Dr. Ram Sami Mudalyar. And then the last committee was set up uh, in 1998 uh, under the special group of Dr. Gopalan. So uh, between this uh, period 56 and, and 98, there were six committees. And all six committees and the previous nine committees, they recommended various routes. And uh, all of them, till this last one, which is not a committee recommendation, but a government recommendation, the last one, the first five, were all through Rameshwaram Island, or in the case of Dr. Ramasana and Muralia, through Mandapam, that is, that portion which juts out from the uh, Indian coastline, to cut through that and uh, take it that way. So, uh, Dr. Ramasana and Muralia's committee actually very specifically said, under no circumstances, Rama Setu should be touched. And he gave some reasons, which I'll go to if, if any of you are interested later on. But at the moment, the problem has arisen not in terms of furrowing. And why is it necessary to furrow? Because if you want a ship to go from Tutikari to Ch Chennai, you cannot go directly today, so you have to go around Sri Lanka and then uh, end up in Chennai. And that means 30 hours extra. To cut down this cost and have ships to be able to go quickly, this project was always thought of, of, of being done. So this is the uh, whole idea behind the Sage Samuel project. But my objection began with saying, why did you select this route? This route was selected ever since the DMK joined the central government. And they uh, began insisting, no, it should go by this route. All the other previous five routes, we reject. We want this route. No committee recommendation, no commission recommendation, no expert body recommendation. It was a decision of the DMK and the government of which they were a member. And so they insisted that this uh, route should be through by breaking the Ramisetu. And that's where the problem arose because I actually the credit belongs to the Vishwanda Parishad and the RSS. They were the first ones. Rama Gopalan or Hindu many in fact collected 35 lakh signatures, all verifiable signatures, name, address, telephone number and signature, and gave it to the president saying no, this cannot be done. And uh, the Vishwanda Parishad held rallies around the country and so on. But it was, they, were, they were not caring. And uh, the court, uh, in the court, many religious leaders and many others went and filed cases and the court dismissed all of them, saying, nah, we won't look at it. So at one stage, the RSS chief, Mr. Sudarshan, called me up and he said, and Swami Dayanam Saraswati, and said, now it looks like Ram Setu uh, is going to be broken. They have decided to uh, do it on such and such day. So I checked up and my people in government told me so. So I went to court and asked for a stay. And I got a stay. So people asked me, how did you do it when others couldn't do it? Because my argument was not based on religion. I based my argument on three specific rational or secular arguments. 
Number one, I said the choice of root number six is arbitrary. It has no scientific basis. Why do they select root number six when the same objective could have been uh, achieved by other uh, by other means, by other routes? So arbitrariness is a issue, is a matter on which the courts always intervene. Whenever a government makes an arbitrary decision, the courts intervene in judicial review. Second thing I said, the government is unreasonable because I had been writing letters to the government saying Rama Setu, because of this report of the Geological Survey of India, is worthy of being considered as an ancient monument. It's a civil, civil engineering marvel. So make it into uh, investigate and find out whether it is worthy of being declared as a national uh, ancient monument. I didn't say that it should be a religious institution or anything like that. And I said um, ancient monument. The government was f flatly refusing. They were writing a letter, no, we are not interested, we aren't going to do it. So I said this is unreasonable. Because the ancient monuments and archaeological act say that if anyone brings information to the government that uh, such an uh, ancient monument exists, the government is bound, duty bound to investigate. So I said they're being unreasonable. And third I said, which irritated them no end, that this decision is afflicted by bias. And courts have always intervened when you have proved bias in decision making. I said bias is that Karna Nidhi is got a phobia about Ram Chaturji and therefore he is deliberately selecting this route because he wants to humiliate the memory of Ram Chaturji and therefore Karna Nidhi should not be and his chelas like Balu should not be part of the decision making. The whole decision making should be redone minus them and that is Since I didn't speak about Ramayana and I didn't speak about anything else, uh, the court came yesterday. And that stay about last August. After that, this whole process began of argumentation, etc. And final, after lots of adjournments, because the government did very stupid things like filing an affidavit saying, uh, challenging me, saying that Ram doesn't exist. And there were big horror and the VHP arranged Chaka Jam throughout the country. And so they, they, were, they got frightened and they withdrew their affidavit. And then they took six months to file a new affidavit. And finally in May, the hearings, 1st of May to 6th of May, the hearings were held. And uh, in that, uh, um, many of us participated, because there were many petitioners after me, many others came and affiliated themselves. Jalit also said, I want to be also part of this. So she also filed a petition. Then Ramagopala's petition was there and some uh, Kalyan Raman's petition. There were so five, six. So we got a top lawyer for each of them. But for me, I do not have a, a, a keep a lawyer. I went myself. I'm an economist. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, and uh, But I had the blessings of the Acharyas, so Swami Dhan and Saraswati. I had the she gave me Swami who said you must do it. And I had the general approval also of Ashok Singhal when he said that I believe of all politicians I believe you, believe you the most so you go ahead and, and, and do it. So therefore uh, the um, first I made all Soni Sarabji, Parasaran, uh, Venu Gopal, I said you go first. And they went and battered uh, the court on, on the technicalities, on the constitutionalities, etc. And finally my turn came and I spoke for eight hours. Uh, first, so first was, uh, first whole day I spoke for five hours. The next day I spoke for another three hours. And at the end of that, the court had to, I mean, I spoke for so long that we came near the vacation time because the court had to rise for vacation. <laughs> so, but what surprised me is that the court then issued direction to the government without hearing the government. That was what is the, what's interesting. Go back to the drawing board and find out why you cannot have an alternative route. Because then, then we can check.
challenge that report if they came and said, no, no, there's no alternative. I have in fact suggested one extra alternative. I said, if your objective is to go from Tuti Korin to Chennai to Kaki Nada, Visakhapatnam, Kharkaga uh, uh, by the shortest possible route, then what you do is you convert uh, uh, Tuti Korin into a container port. And when the ships come, they will leave the goods, have railway lines start from the port and go all along the coast to Calcutta. So the, the, the goods will be there put in railway wagons uh, and then taken across or have a, a freeway, expressway or a turnpike. These I proved by economics and it's there in my book that are cheaper than uh, this Setu Samutram project. In fact, the development spillovers would be much more. So, they have to look at all that now. And I pulled out from the minutes of the Setu Samutram project meetings to show that the planning commission had suggested that you please look at this also. And they rejected it, saying, no, we are, my mind is made up, we are not going to look at it. And so the court pounced on that also, and said, have a look at this. That's one. Second, the government said, you are duty bound to conduct an archaeological survey to find out whether Rama Setu is worthy of being named as an ancient monument. Find, do the investigation, and come back. And... Uh, The uh, archaeological survey is now giving a public statement that uh, in order to meet international standards for this investigation, it will take us another four years. So for four years, uh, meantime, I hope there will be a good government, a nationalist government. And in this I'd like to say one thing that one of the questions that is posed to us is, to me particularly, why you are, uh, uh, you know, allowing religion to block development. This contradiction that you are blocking religion uh, development by raising religious issues. Now, this is a nonsensical uh, question according to me, because it's got nothing to do with uh, religion per se. There was an alternative way of doing things. They have decided not to do it. I am not saying that don't have the project at all. Have the project, but there are other ways to do it, and you do it that way. And this has been our practice, that we have adjusted religious uh, demands uh, whenever it is possible. For example, I have received a, have received a letter from a man called E. Sri Dharan, who is the head of the Delhi Metro. And he has made a tremendous name by producing world-class metro uh, in Delhi. And uh, I had uh, learned that he had some difficulty in scheduling the route or route alignment of the Delhi Metro from All India Medical Institute to Gurgaon via Uttar Binar. So I wrote him a letter and told him that this is what occurred. I would like a clear-cut explanation as to what really happened. So he wrote me a letter which I filed in the Supreme Court and read in the Supreme Court also. And in that letter he says that we had decided to extend the, uh, the metro from All India Medical Institute to Gurgaon via Kutub Minar. And everything was set. It was a 2,500 crore project, just like Setu Samaram is also 2,500 crore. And uh, after the work had begun, one Islamic NGO wrote a letter to the Prime Minister saying that this uh, 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 metro route will generate vibrations when it comes near Kutub Minar and there are three graves there, Kabristans, and they will develop cracks and this will hurt our sentiment. So the route of the, uh, of the metro must be changed. So he is written, um, Susan writes to me in his letter, the Prime Minister summoned me and asked me that why don't you change the route? And I said, we have done all the investigation. Not only this Kabristan, there are a number of residential colonies. No, none of them is objecting. And therefore, the, you know, there is no question just because one, one NGO writes, I, you should not take it seriously. He said, no, 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 we have to accommodate. 
What's your problem? He said, well, the only other route I can have is to go, instead of going over the ground, I want to go underground because there's no way I can find land to go on an overground route anywhere else. So I have to go and this will cost me 500 crores extra. So the project, 2,500 crores to 3,000 crores. That means on a 20% uh, 20%, uh, 150, or 20% uh, rise in the budget, and then this whole, this whole problem of digging, etc., there will be a delay of another one year, and so it's not worth it. Prime said, 500 crores, no problem, take 500 crores. And he said, I'm authorizing it, and you'll get the authorization later tomorrow. One year delay, what is one year delay in accommodating some cracks in the uh, Kapistan? So I told the court, for uh, Kapristan you can change the route, but for Ramchandraji you cannot change the route. What is this going on? <laughs> now you see, uh, uh, therefore, the uh, country we have done this, not only in this Kutub case, we have done it for uh, Tipu Sultan's palace also. We have changed the route of the Bangalore metro for the same reason. So consequently, uh, this kind of accommodation is something they should do. But the clinching argument of mine with the court were two. One was uh, on the question of legality of the project and two was on the economics of it. First was on the legality. There is a law in a uh, section in our Indian Penal Code called Section 295. <coughs> and Section 295 states that if anyone damages, slights, or destructs any religious, uh, any object held sacred by the people, thank you. If it damages <coughs> or damages or uh, fractures or destroys any religious, any object held sacred by the people, by a section of the people, abused by the people, by a section of the people, then it is a crime and there is a, uh, you will have to, there is a uh, sentence of two years in jail. So I pointed out that uh, to the judge, to the two Supreme Court, three Supreme Court judges, that it's a criminal offense to touch Rama Setu. Because Rama Setu is held sacred by a very large section of uh, people, and said, in fact, one billion Hindus. I will produce letters of all the Shankaracharyas. All the Shankaracharyas have given me a letter saying Rama Setu is sacred and you will not allow it to be broken. I gave a letter from the, uh, uh, Swami Dhanan Saraswati who heads the apex body of all sadhus called Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha, which has all Shankaracharyas as members, Pitalipatis and Mata, well, Mathadishis and Mahamandaleshwaras and, and Akadas, all of them are members of this. It's an unprecedented organization and which he has well, put up, for which he must be congratulated and he is the convener and he gave a letter. I also showed what Ramagopalan of the Hindu money had produced 35 lakh signatures. So I said the, the, the section is a holding it sacred is no doubt. And therefore, I said anyone who breaks it, there will be a criminal case. So the Chief Justice asked me, you will find a case against us also. So I said, well, I can't find it against you just now because you have still not authorized them to break it. then definitely I will file a case against you. Many yeah. people thought, you know, I have been so rude, and, you know, I will be held for contempt. But the law is clear in my, uh, in my case. It is very clear what is sacred is not to be decided by the court. It is to be decided by the people. All the court can do is to decide whether, yes, there are people or not. <laughs> not whether it is worthy of being sacred. So therefore, I was right in saying that. And uh, uh, consequently, the judges, uh, one uh, Justice Arundhan said, well, you see, it may be sacred, but who goes to the middle of the ocean uh, to worship the Ramasif? I said, well, uh, first of all, let me say that I worship the sun. We all worship the sun, but I never go there. <laughs> But more than that, 
Skanda Purana says, what are the pujas to be conducted uh, for going to Rama Setu and at Rama Setu and what are to be done for the Shiva Lingas there. The all long descriptions are there and uh, how Lord uh, Skanda Purana records Shiva is saying that if people, you people do not stop worshipping the Rama Setu, then I have no place in Rameshwara. All that I have pointed out to. So therefore, it is clearly an object, a sacred object. And the Supreme Court has many judgments on this. In 1958, there was uh, this uh, Evi Ramaswami Naikar. Have you heard of Evi Ramaswami Naikar? <laughs> you know, the Dravida Kagam leader who who believed in rationalism and debunking religion, particularly Hindu religion. He never debunked uh, Christianity or Islam. He only debunked Hindu religion. He uh, <coughs> one day went to a shop and bought a Ganesha and then in the evening he had a public meeting in front of everybody he broke it and he said you idiot uh, Hindus I have broken uh, <coughs> the Vinayaka uh, statue and nothing has happened to me you and your gods are nothing so somebody filed a case and went to the Supreme Court and in the Supreme Court uh, uh, the lawyers of Ramaswami Naika took the stand that this Vinayaka was on a shelf in a shop and he paid money out of his pocket and bought it. It became his personal property. And therefore what he does with that personal property is his business. To who can object? This is not a vinegar from a temple that you can say that, uh, uh, that you cannot break it. So Supreme Court has held that an object, however trivial in value, however insignificant, if it is held sacred, even if it is not worshipped, if it is image produce a feeling of sacredness, then breaking it is breaking the law, section 295, and therefore you are guilty of criminal offense. This is the Supreme Court judgment. So, <laughs> therefore, uh, once the Rama Setu is held sacred, there is no project which can touch it. So this is already doomed. Uh, because, uh, in fact, tomorrow when I go back to, uh, to Chennai, I'm leaving day by day after back to India. One of the things I'm going to do is to file a criminal case against uh, T.R. Baru. Uh, because in, on 23rd January, he ordered the treasure to go and break the Ramasetu. Of course, it didn't, the Ramasetu didn't break. The treasure broke and fell into the ocean. And, uh, and not only the treasure, he sent afterwards a, a crane to pick up the, uh, uh, the uh, treasure so he could collect the insurance. And the crane broke and went into the ocean. So then he brought in a Russian engineer to find out what is happening. The Russian engineer climbed on Lama Setu, slipped and fell and broke both his legs and had to be sent back to uh, Russia. Finally, the workers started getting nervous, some voodoo is going on or something, and uh, they wanted to run away. So the Setu Samadham project decided to hold a puja, a havan. And they asked the MLA of that area, Ramadapuram, to come and uh, break the coconut. So, the MLA of the area was a Congress MLA called the Chur Balakrishnan. He came, he broke the, uh, uh, the coconut and he went back and his car had an accident and he died. <laughs> so now these are of course coincidences. And I told uh, the judges also the, the, these incidents, I said these are coincidences. And uh, I'm not saying that if you tomorrow order this... Uh, <laughs> One of the one of the judges' wives told him that for God's sake, don't order the breaking of Rama Setu. Our family will be cursed for four generations. So uh, they, this is the uh, they have tried to break it. I am going to go and file a case now uh, because I got the documentation that uh, it was Baru who uh, ordered the. Uh, demolition and the uh, and the danger had gone so before I had gone to court. You I, put in jail. Uh, well, uh, uh, they are all heading that way. So, uh, <laughs> in any case, this is the 
uh, this is the fact that this is illegal. To touch Rama Setu is illegal. So, as far as today I can tell you, there is nobody in India who can henceforth say, break the Rama Setu. If anyone says, <laughs> The second illegality in the project is that any project which is more than 5 crores, which involves you know, something to do with the coastal area or ocean, has to get the NOC of the state government of that area. And in this case it is Tamil Nadu. So in 2005 the state government was headed by Jalalita. And the central government asked for NOC. Jayalita then appointed a committee to go into the question whether NOC should be given. She appointed a former head of the National Institute of Ocean Technology, Mr. Ravindran, to uh, examine. He came out with a fact report saying that this environmental uh, report which the government is using is totally flawed, the data are bogus, and the following additional investigation must be done and the report must be given. There only NOC to be given or not given is to be considered. So they flatly refused to give the NOC. But despite that, the government disregarded that and went and inaugurated the project. So in fact, the Prime Minister and, uh, and Sonia Gandhi and Karnanidhi committed a crime uh, under the law because it's a violation of the environmental law. There's a punishment there also. And uh, by going and inaugurating this project. So there's no NOC and therefore their project is illegal. Third thing is that if you require NOC also from the Maritime Board as well as the Coast Guard on the security angle. They never got that. They didn't even apply for it. <laughs> and uh, they went ahead and... So this is the third illegality. Fourth... The huh? They rule the country. Yeah, they rule the country. You allow them to rule the country also. <laughs> so the uh, fourth thing is that since the route is just on the border, between India and Sri Lanka, that is the medial line in the ocean. Therefore, there is a UN law of the sea 1968 which says that where such projects are taken, there should be a joint determination of the environmental consequences by that project. India has never consulted Sri Lanka. And therefore, the Sri Lankan government has been beyond writing letters to the government of India saying, please do a joint inspection with us. They have not done it. Sri Lanka has the power to go to the International Court of Justice in Hague and ask the International Court of Justice in Hague to appoint a third party uh, investigator of the environmental uh, uh, sustainability of the project. The Sri Lankan governments have not done it. The High Commissioner wrote me a letter which I read out in court saying that so far we have not done it, but when we lose hope, we shall certainly do it. So I told the court that even if you give clearance, the Sri Lankan government is going to go to the court and there will be an immediate uh, stay uh, from the International Court of Justice. So these the four illegalities are there. And what a, dis I mean, what a uh, disregard of the law by the government of India has taken place. And what for? So that Rama Setu can be broken. And this, this mentality, one has to understand why. They say it's a mythical thing. It is a man-made thing. When you haven't done an investigation, how do you know? Tomorrow you do an investigation, you may find out that it, in fact it is not mythical. It is a reality. For example, for 150 years, the Englishman was making fun of the Vedas, saying it is all bogus because Vedas are full of prayers to Saraswati River. And there is no Saraswati river. In fact, Ganga references are very few in Veda. The Saraswati uh, references are maximum. And it's a very Saraswati river. There is no Saraswati river. So maybe Veda is written somewhere else and it is not part of India and all that. The Englishman did play havoc with this. But in 1982, when Professor Yashpal was the head of the space agency, they used the satellite and discovered that the Saraswati Nagar, uh, river does exist and it is under the ground now. For a variety of geological reasons, it has gone underground. And so today, nobody will say that Saraswati Nagar River is a, is a mythical river. It does exist and uh, it is underground. Similarly, Dwarka, 
Krishna's Gartha, where is it? The Englishman used to say that the Mahabharata is a bogus thing. Where is this Gartha where Krishna was supposed to have been the Raja and all that? And there is no uh, sign of that kind of civilization. Harappa is, uh, is uh, has all these ruins. You can see where is the Gartha? We are told Krishna was 3000 BC and around the same time or a little uh, after the uh, uh, Harappa Mahujadaro. And uh, where is the uh, remains of Dwarka? But Dr. S. R. Rao, the Director General of Archaeological Survey of India, with his team did five years of research underwater in 1995, discovered that Dwarka does exist as a whole city, but all under the sea, because there was an earthquake in, a, in year 12 AD, and which brought the whole Dwarka under the ocean. And now the government of India has given 1,000 crores to the Archaeological Survey of India to lift all the remains of Dwarka and put it in a museum and they are going to call it Krishna Nagar Dwarka and show it to the whole world. So Dwarka till yesterday. Till yesterday Dwarka was mythical and today his science has proved to be real. How do we know that this uh, uh, this so uh, uh, this Rama Sethu once should dis- uh, have an investigation will not turn out to be man-made and therefore it is man-made obviously it was made in the Rama, uh, time of Ramayana and therefore we have to look at it the uh, Karnali's insistence and in my opinion Sonia Gandhi's insistence also she is also very determined the, um, uh, the Prime Minister who is a friend of mine for 40 years uh, he, 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 you know that he is a very good man, very honest man, very educated man, but he was born without a spinal cord, so therefore, <laughs> so therefore he, he did not even take a stand. But privately he tells me what, uh, where the pressures are coming from, and both these people are insistent that the uh, Rama Setu must be broken. Now, I, I personally feel that uh, we have to go into this question as to why uh, this kind of, uh, uh, why we are doing this kind of uh, thing. Now, I would say, therefore, economically also, and I'll try to conclude after that, economically this project is a complete waste of money because you will be making only losses. What is the argument for profit? that ships will come to Tutikore and presently have to go around they will spend 30 hours more per fuel ship fuel uh, uh, will be spent so make all the cost that will be saved if they go this way they will save 30 hours then that means so much fuel less and therefore so much cost less and 50% of that we will apply as tariff and we will cover, recover the cost of the project this is what they are saying now after all first of all which ships will be going through this channel? Only ships with less than 30,000 dead weight tonnage uh, weight. Because the, uh, the 12 feet furrow, deep furrow, is only sufficient for ships of the weight of 30,000 or less uh, tonnage. So, how many, what percentage of ships are less than 30,000 tonnage today? Only 5%. 95% of the ships are above 30,000. In fact, they are above 60,000. About 10 years ago, the number of uh, ships in the world which had tonnage of 30,000 or less was 20%. It is now down to 5%. And I am told in another 10 years it will be 0% because they are going for larger and larger ships. So 10 years hence, you will not have any ships being able to go except ships belonging to T.R. Balu's company which are all less than 30,000 and, and boats belonging to LTT which are also less than 30,000. This appears to be a project to help uh, Mr. Uh, T.R. Balu uh, to earn money and uh, perhaps the LTT to do its nefarious activities because the uh, DNK is a close ally of the LTT and that's why it was being done. So uh, that is one aspect. Second is you say that the ships will save time by going through the channel. Take a ship coming from Mauritius, going to Calcutta. Will it use the Sethusamadam channel or go around Sri Lanka? Well, if it goes around Sri Lanka, then it will go at full speed which is possible in open seas. And that is 12 knots, 14 knots. 
per hour. Well, if it comes to the safety zone project, the project report itself says that it has to slow down to four knots or five knots. It cannot go with speed. Why? Because the channel is not built on rock with walls, like the Suez Canal has walls, because it is cutting through land, so you will never wall. Panama Canal will never wall. You know exactly where the channel is. But in the case of Sethu Samudram, you cannot tell where the channel is, uh, because it is underwater. So you need a pilot to take the ship. So the ship will come, stop, then you pilot will have to come, for you know, hopefully he is not on strike on that day, <laughs> and then he will tag it along, and uh, take it across, it will go on so slow speed, it will be only four, so the uh, sailing will be very, very little. Therefore, ships coming from Mauritius, and this is there in my book, they will prefer to go around Sri Lanka to Calcutta rather than go through Sethu Samadhi project. So, where is these numbers? They are saying 8,000 ships will use Sethu Samadhi project. In my opinion, not more than 500. <laughs> and therefore, if you use 500 and calculate the tariff given on their numbers, you will, the country will lose 300 crores per year from the very first year and by the fifth year it will rise to 1000 crores minus 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 it will be and not only that this is an underestimate because this, this channel you see will have to be dredged every month Every week, some people say, because the ocean uh, will bring mud and put it again in the channel, so you have to again go and take the mud out so that the thing is clear. And Balu's son has a dredging company, so he will get permanent uh, employment uh, in uh, dredging. The dredging operations will go on taking place. So this is a pure route that has taken place. This has no economic basis whatsoever. Leave aside the environment basis. Leave aside the uh, national security basis. Now all this, I'm saying on economics of it and the illegality of it, this project cannot be sustained. So, uh, what I would like to say therefore is that I am not, I am pretty sure that this uh, uh, project uh, will not see the light of day. It's gone back to the drawing board. By the time comes, there will be general elections, there will be total sea change that will take place. I don't think anybody is going to do it. In any case, even if they wanted to break it, now they can't break it because it's an accepted principle that this will be a criminal violation. The courts will never be. In my opinion, why they gave me an ex parte order is they became convinced. They became convinced, the court became convinced that this is an illegal project and therefore they didn't want to hurt the feelings of the government and they said go back to the drawing board and come back with new proposals and therefore I am not uh, uh, anymore worried that the uh, Rama Setu is going to be a, a problem. Karnanidhi's whole mentality has been always to rubbish Ram's name. He says which uh, Ram Setu, which engineer, which engineer he called he got a degree? <laughs> so I said, so, uh, I recently asked him because he felt sick, so he was admitted to Ramchandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> so I, I asked him, I, I know publicly, that uh, when did Ramchandra ji get an MD to treat you in Ramchandra Medical College? <laughs> so th this mentality is a pure hatred for Ram. Where it politically suits him, he has not bothered or worried about uh, using it for his, uh, for his benefit. For example, uh, there is bullfighting that goes on in this, in my home district called Madurai, which is called Jalli Kattu. Every season just before harvesting or just after harvesting, they allow bulls to run in the lanes of the, the crowded lanes of the city and then, uh, or rather in the suburban part of the city and therefore when then people change it, they, they irritate the uh, bulls and the bulls sometimes go people, kill people also. So the government of India's animal welfare board, they came uh, to before the Supreme Court and said this is all cruelty to animals, put a ban on this, uh, on this game called Chali Kattu. So the Supreme Court gave a ban, I mean gave a stay, said no. Karnanidhi's government, Tamil Nadu government, went back to the court and said, please review your own order because this is a matter which involves the religion of the people and if you ban it, people will think the gods are cursed.
worse them and there will be public disorder and the government must understand that where religions involve development is not so important. <laughs> this is an application they have filed with two days before my case was to be heard. And I stood in court and said what to they are talking from both sides of their mouths. They cannot take one stand there and one stand here. Similarly, the seeing that public has started coming in a big way now. Everybody knows Ram Setu. So people are going to Rameshwaram are now going to Dhanushpati and going to Ram Setu and so on. So much so that in Sri Lanka things, Mama, we can also have a lot of uh, tourist revenue. They have announced 34 sites connected to Ramachandra and Ramayana. One side they have said, this is where Sita had her bath. This is where Raman was killed. This is where Hanuman dropped the mountain containing Sanjeevini. They have identified 334 spots and I have given you those things in my book you can see. And they are also promoting uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, tourism through this. And I also found, so to my surprise, one day I was... I was recently going by train to Dehradun and they have on our trains they have you know pictures of various parts of India and there was one which I found which is there in my book also and uh, it's, it's this which I saw my hung on the on the side of the train in the inside compartment of a train and what does it show? It shows uh, Rav Chandraji and, uh, and Lakshman standing together and all these Vanaras carrying boulders on their head and putting it and the top it says listen to the waves telling their stories at Rameshwaram that's what the top says and here it says uh, the waters here still carry the blessings of Lord Rama's lotus feet <laughs> what, what poetic language because this is where the monkey army crossed over to Lanka to rescue Sita visit Rameshwaram in Tamil Nadu, India, issued by Tamil Nadu Tourism Development Corporation. I read this out also in the report. I said, this is the Tamil Nadu government. They are playing on both sides of the street. And uh, to earn a little money, they can do anything, I said. And therefore, the court also took notice of it and told the uh, told the, uh, told the uh, uh, Tamil Nadu Council that since when have you started observing Rama's lotus feet? Uh, so, therefore, uh, in, in my opinion, all this is part of a political game which they have played. I am not in any politics. I certainly would say even if this project was economically powerful, I still oppose it. Because Rama Setu cannot be touched. And the law it cannot be touched and it's a question of sentiment. And this has been proved by a massive rally held by Vichwadu Parishad on 30th uh, December in Delhi uh, where 10 lakh people came. They all came on their own highly disciplined. In fact, Sri Lankan of the Delhi Metro told me that it is the day when we earned 12 lakh rupees in our tariff on Delhi Metro because all these people came, bought a ticket and they went by train. I have never seen such a, such a dedication. So this is something they will demonstrate it. So the question now is, why is this happening? We have to understand this. Recently, Sri Ashok Singh told me that why don't you take interest in Ram Janmabhumi also? <laughs> I think maybe I'll have to go back to law school and take a law degree. <laughs> but you see, you see there also, there is a constitutional bench judgment which says, and this is headed by a Muslim, namely Justice Amadi, and this constitutional bench says, that masjid is not an essential part of Islam. Masjid is a convenience for reading namaz. Namaz can be read anywhere. Therefore, government can acquire a masjid for public purposes. This is there in the judgment 1994, Ismail Faruqi versus the government of India. Now, when that is the position, why should the government of India acquire the masjid 
in Varanasi, in Vrindavan, and in uh, uh, Ayodhya, and say that for public purpose, Ayodhya, Varanasi will now become, as it was before, a Kashi Vishwanath temple in the complete form. <laughs> Same thing with Vrindavan. Half of it has been broken and a masjid has been built. It was all done deliberately. In the case of uh, Ayodhya, the only problem is that the court has held that breaking of the Babri Masjid was illegal. It was unauthorized. They are, what they did, they took the law out from it. But that's a subsidiary issue. The issue of whether a Ram temple can come is something which is there is no law to stop it. Why 83% of the Hindus in this country, of our country, should be so passive in this matter? After all, it's Ram Tamadji's survey. Our temples are not like masjids. Our temples, to build our temples, you have to fast for 41 days. Then, according to Agama Shastra, you have to perform a large number of pujas till into that stone image God's own spirit is infused. So it becomes a holy place. A temple and a masjid cannot be compared. And therefore, what is it that is wrong with us? That all these things we has to happen. Those in our country, we have to defend Ram Chandraji and say that we have to protect it. Will we require that for others? Will you can expect in any Christian majority country that we have to go to court and prove that Christ was born of a virgin? They can never prove that anyway. You cannot prove it. But no one is going to prove it in a court of law that Christ was born of a, of a virgin. And similarly, in Kashmir you have this Hazrat Bal. There is a bottle with, a, with, a, with hair of Muhammad, which is considered very sacred. And one day it went missing. So uh, the Muslims rioted. And the rioting continued for three days. And the government didn't know what to do. They could not uh, uh, contain it. Fortunately, one lieutenant colonel came and said, I have found it. And he, <laughs> and he showed it. And it was put back and everything became quiet. But how do you know that lieutenant colonel didn't go to a hairdressing saloon and did some hair in the bar? You haven't done any D in DNA, uh, DNA analysis. So, there is a question of faith. And you are not going to interfere with that. But we find in our country, on every single issue of Hindus, you have to fight all the way, just to establish a small thing. So, uh, and with a majority, uh, elect, with, a, with a government elected by the Hindus. So, time has come now for us to recognize this. It's not enough to be, as I said, you can have a thousand goats standing in a forest, one tiger comes, all the four thousand goats will run away. It's not enough to be have numbers, it's not enough to be strong individually. It's not enough to just go to do puja and to uh, celebrate Ramayan, uh, Ramila or uh, you know visit temples. You have to have a corporate Hindu psychology. And that corporate Hindu psychology must exercise much. Fortunately on 15th and 16th of July, uh, Swami Dayan Saraswati has convened a meeting of eminent Hindu thinkers to which I have also been invited. And I did, in fact, yesterday, this morning, Dhanan Saraswati phoned me up to tell me that I should draw up a Hindu agenda which should be adopted in the election. For one election... For one election, don't look at anything else. Let the Hindus together vote for a Hindu agenda. That party or that front which is propagating a Hindu agenda and all the sadhus say this is the, uh, this is the uh, front you should vote for, this is a symbol you should vote for. If all the sadhus combine and say, should it? And all Hindus will not combine. Out of 83%, if 40% combine, you've got absolute majority. Uh, the remaining 43% can remain secular, we don't mind. The 40%, if they can uh, consolidate, you can do it. And ultimately, we need to develop our identity. There's so much confusion. What is India? India, what is, which country is it? Is it something that the British created in 1947? Or is it an ancient country? If we 
India, the ancient country, how is the Muslim and Christian connected with it? So these are questions which you have to answer. And I have said, I have proposed that the identity of India is Hindustan, which means a land of Hindus and those others whose ancestors are Hindus. Or, or those others who proudly acknowledge that their ancestors are Hindus. So if the Muslims and Christians say our ancestors are Hindus, you are part of Hindustan. If you say your ancestors are Gauri and Ghazni, then you better go to Pakistan. We don't belong uh, to our country. That is the, uh, uh, the identity of India. It's a continuing civilization. The continuing civilization is a Hindu civilization. Even if people have other religion, the culture is Hindu. That has to be imposed uh, uh, by, with the help of, with the willingness of the people. And we have to make people accept this. And uh, consequently, there are certain things that we have to do. Why I have been propagating for a long time that Sanskrit should become the national language of India. And it is because, because Sanskrit vocabulary is there in every language. In the world of Tamil, 40% of the words are Sanskrit. Karuna Nidhi is really a Sanskrit name. <laughs> if I, I asked Karuna Nidhi, what will you say in Tamil for your election symbol? He said, Chinnam. I said, Chinnam? Where did this Chinnam come from? It came from Sanskrit word Chin. And I said, what is your Chinnam? He said, Udayan Suryan. I said, what Tamil is that? <laughs> so, consequently, every Indian language has a Sanskrit vocabulary in large percentage in Malayalam it is as much as 80%, Bangali maybe 90%. So consequently we should ultimately try to bring Sanskrit back. The way we do it is to use Hindi and go on Sanskritizing the vocabulary of Hindi till it becomes Sanskrit. And this is what Shankaracharya this is what Adi Shankaracharya did with Pali. When he came, Pali had taken over Sanskrit. And then he said, no, 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 don't ask for removal of Pali. Make vocabulary of Pali more and more Sanskrit. And the Pali went on becoming Sanskritized. And ultimately Pali disappeared and Sanskrit came back. So Sanskrit, the true history of India, India is not Aryans and Dravidians, they are all bogus. Where DNA has now proved that we are all the same people. Caste is not got to do with birth, it is a discipline. The Bhrigu and Bhagavad in their debate have established that caste is to be created on the basis of discipline. They said there are four Bhrigu said, Rishi Bhrigu said there are four sources of power. One is knowledge, second is weapon, third is wealth, fourth is land. These four should not be in one hand, they should be in separate, separate hands. Therefore, those who have knowledge will not have wealth, will not have weapons, but they will have social status and they will have to live by begging and people should be honored to give them uh, what they ask for in begging. Similarly, the uh, Raja, the man who has the weapons will defend the country, but he will not make policy. Policy will be made by the government. People who make money, will can make money, but they will not have the say in the running of the country. And those who have land will produce for the whole country. They will have the, 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 the uh, great gratitude of the country, but land by itself cannot decide. So this is the whole idea, but somewhere it got connected with birth. And uh, they, if you adopt the discipline of that caste, you become of that caste. That's why Valmiki was from a hunter family, some say he was a Dalit, and he became a Mahishi. The Vedic classes, mother was a fisherwoman, and he became, he wrote the Mahabharata, and then he became a Harishi. Uh, then uh, um, uh, Vishwamitra, he was a Kshatriya, he was considered Shia Vishis. Uh, Kalidasa was a, was a, was a Vanavasi. He was a, in fact, uh, sitting on a tree and doing foolish things. Uh, he was uh, taken by the Brahmins and made into a Maharishi, ultimately became a Kavi of Kavis, you see. So, uh, the only prominent Brahmin I can think of today is Ravan. Ravan was a Brahmin guy. <laughs> Ravan was a Brahmin, was a great Pandit, but he had got so much ahankar, so much of his arrogance, that the Lord decided the time had come to destroy him. And that's how he was destroyed, he was killed by a Kshatriya. 
and the Brahmins of India do not worship Ravan or, or against Ram for killing a, 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 killing a Brahmin. They worship a Kshatriya because he fought on the rights of for the side, the side of good. So consequently this understanding of what we are, this is a civilization that must be nurtured and grow. There should be a renaissance in it and that can only come if we collectively decide that yes, we want a Hindu, uh, Hindu focus to our polity and the Hindu focus will come by collectivity. This is what I think Rama Sethu should engineer in our thoughts. Thank you very much. And uh, there is no further intelligent discussion possible once that shutter is down. <laughs>